and welcome to another crossover event of Lizzie Watches Yowie and Beneath Your Skin, our demonic possession horror podcast. And we are talking about Vatican Miracle Examiners, which just gets better and better with each episode and gets queerer with each episode. And yeah, this one definitely is in line with our horror themed podcast because this one does have a case of demonic possession although in this one they actually investigate it a hell of a lot better than they do in half the movies and it's only a two minute scene but yes it's gorgeous so true you are still a monster for the cliffhanger at the end of this episode but i adored it and yes their research are still better than in many movies we had to endure for our Beneath Your Skin podcast. Hello, dear. So our lovely episode starts off with our beautiful Joseph and Roberto trying to break into Mikhail Brown's office. And they're like, oh, should priests really be picking locks? It's like, who knows? But apparently Roberto has the secret skill of also being a lock pick and can break into places he shouldn't be. Because, well, he's a clever, resourceful young man who's also gorgeous. And I love his monocle when he reads things. I'm just like, oh, he doesn't just wear glasses. No, he has a monocle to read his ancient texts. But they break into this office and it's all kind of bathed in this eerie red light. And then you can vaguely behind this like thin curtain see the figure of a, of a person. And you're like, what is going on there? Then beautiful credits, which are gorgeous, full of symbolism and art and gorgeousness and priests like being semi-gay by falling away from each other and reaching. And it's all like, oh, oh, this is set me in the right mood. So we then go back to our office and we find out the figure is the mummified remains of one Father Mikhail Brown. And he's also mummified in all the priestly robes. Now, I don't know the difference in very priestly robes. These are what I normally call the, like the fancy priestly robes because they're the white ones as opposed to just the normal black ones so he's obviously revered basically the white robe he wears is the white robe the pope wears and he's the only priest in the whole catholic church who is allowed to wear white okay. yeah so he probably shouldn't be in a pope's outfit in this weird office but alas okay so yeah they're saying how like oh my goodness father brown was really revered i'm like maybe a little too revered but also roberto is finding all his exciting books he finds something he's calling the devil's book which apparently is like the bible but instead of written by man was written by the devil himself and he and it's written in enochian and he also finds another book of runes and runic language but he says that how this runic book is again all kind of code and seems to be more of a counterfeit than an old like like rare book on runic culture and we also get the title of our episode which is secrets of the gods and the beast of 666 which i feel like is apt because they discuss god's secrets and the beast of 666 appears in this episode so you know it makes sense a lot of sense, and we are talking about gods, not singular, but plural. So we know something is up with this episode. Yes. So they have a little look around, and then, not Roberto, I love Roberto, he's always in my brain, always in my brain. Joseph is like, oh, this drawer's a bit heavy, and I'm like, ah, it's a trick drawer, and it is. And they find the other half of the tally, and the tally does not say, like, glory and riches, it says Hein. And if you put it together, it says Heinrich. So they're like, yay, we found the other half of the tally. That's one of our missions dealt with. We don't know the meaning of the tally. We still have an immaculate conception. We still have a murderer. We still have like miracles and signs of stigmata. And it's all going down. But they now know that this all together, this little tally, this little ledger has the word Henrik spelt out on it. Now we also get to meet one of our other major characters of it, Lauren. And I want to know, Guy, all this time, did you think Lauren was going to turn out to be a girl or a boy? A girl. Yeah. I was sure if she was a girl. And I was wrong, of course. No. And I already adore him. Yeah. Lauren's got a really interesting backstory, which you'll find out as the episodes go on. But we meet Lauren. And all we really know about Lauren is that it, he is somehow like Joseph's like hacker tech 
like someone on the who doesn't appear to be in the Vatican, but is Joseph's go-to person for like, right, I need some information. He's like that little hacker spy that is always good to have in your corner. We don't know how they know each other or why um, Lauren is so happy to work with Joseph. We also know that he's like, uh, who is this guy behind you? And why is he calling me like rude names? It's like, oh, but obviously Joseph is like, no, you can't be mean to Roberto because we like to keep our faces very close together. And it's like, no, Roberto is not someone you can be mean to, which obviously means that obviously there's other people that he doesn't mind Lauren insulting, but you don't insult Roberto because Roberto is gorgeous and wonderful. And yeah, you just wouldn't do that. So we're introduced to Lauren, who's like gathering some bits of information. And he's like, are you sure you want me to hack level four of the Vatican secret service? And I'm like, I have no idea if there is a level four secret service of the Vatican, but sure, go ahead and hack it so we can find out what Heinrich means in the context of this episode and of these findings. So while Lauren goes off to do his hacking things, we find out that Dolores is missing. And they're like, oh, no, Dolores is missing. And at the same time as she goes missing, they're like, oh, by the way, this is Father McGee. He's just turned up and he's going to be living in the room next door to you. Oh, he doesn't seem to shake hands. And I'm like, wait a minute. Isn't that the guy that turned up in the room and went, hey, Dolores, he wants you. It's time. And it's like, so it's like, yeah, already like all the suspicion. And he's a genetist. Mm, there is something rotting there. Definitely. But one of our bigger mysteries is solved and is what has been going on with Carlos. And it turns out it's as awful as you kind of thought it might be. In fact, it was more awful because I didn't actually realise that was going to be Carlos's path. They managed to like keep that sneaky. You kind of always assumed that in this school full of absolutely beautiful boys and demon worship and old priests with like, you know, secrets, you knew you were going to undercover like a paedophile ring but it's not so much as a paedophile ring as opposed to one poor boy who's been passed around the priests and that's why Carlos is not in a great place but at first they're like Carlos has been possessed and he sounds possessed he's like doing all the like you know the usual possession funny voices screaming like writhing around in the bed and Roberto and Joseph are like okay we're gonna go in with an exorcism and they have a flashback to when they were told, like, the devil may be lying in wait for you. Here is holy water. And they suit up, you know, the, the sash, the holy water, the Bible, the rosary. And they're like, OK, we're going to sort this out. The door closes and they go to start performing the exorcism. And they're like, poor Carlos is tied to the to bed and he's not having a very good day. And they're like, what is your name, demon? What is your name? And he's like, I am Father Klaus. And they're like, what? It's like, Klaus, I made a deal with the devil so that I could come back from the dead and be reincarnated. And it's like, whoo, that's plausible. It's plausible because we don't write, we can't write off that actually the devil is running around the halls of this thing and there's something a bit dodge about Klaus. But it turns out it was all far worse than that. Joseph actually finally does some investigating. He kind of snaps out of the heat of the moment and actually starts looking at the scene logically and going, he is showing signs that he's been drugged and that he could be having an overdose. And then he spots that on the floor there is like residue of like drug powder and stuff. And he's like, wait a minute, this boy is not possessed. This boy has been heavily drugged and he has just gone into shock and nightmares and he's ODing. So they stop the exorcism to save Carlos and find out what has been going on. And it turns out that poor Carlos, poor Carlos was pretty much being used as the sex toy for the older priests. And they were passing him around and he didn't want to do it, but he was forced to do it. So they made him take drugs so he'd be more like compliable. And then he got addicted to the drugs. So he was selling his body around the place to get the drugs. And it's all really awful because I wasn't expecting that. So the guy saying he would kill him, it's not like if you tell anyone, I'll kill you. It's I'll tell if you tell anyone about you being abused, he was going to kill him. And then obviously, like, he was, like, given a one last overdose to hopefully kill him off. But luckily, our gorgeous Vatican examiners came in and saw what was really going on and they are like no we believe you and joseph is really understanding and kind and he's like like anything that you've done during this time god will completely like forgive you clear slate do not suffer 
with this knowledge, we're going to help you out. And I was like, oh, thank goodness. Because really, that was that was a whole host of awful. Poor Carlos. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, of course, it's never nice when you find out that a boy is being abused by a figure of power. And yeah, it was very awful. But now we have another problem because we solved this mystery, but we have another problem. Who gave Carlos his last dose in hope of killing him because Father Klaus was already dead? Mm. So it's got to be like Santos or so many of them with fantasy names. But I've been calling him the white-haired one because of the oldest one, because he's still around screaming miracle and distractions at everybody. So it's like, I, my money's and, on him. And drinking that awful concoction. Yes, exactly. I'm like, I don't trust you. You And he was the first abuser. He was the first abuser and then thought, you know what I'm going to do with this boy that I have coerced into like a sexual relationship against his will? I'm going to tell the other priests to have a go. And I'm like, is that which? But now we know why the killer went after Klaus, because Klaus is killing off people who are committing sins, and their sins are quite the reverse of the martyrs that they are representing in the window. So now we know that Klaus was not a good guy and probably very much deserved death. But, yeah. No, it's, it's not and the good. and the older priest who died like Saint Andrew, he probably deserved to die too so yeah i still am a bit um, confused about uh, uh, sister dorothea and uh, father francesco because they were screwing each other so i don't see anything too wrong about that well compared to I mean, like yeah but yes but we have this interesting conundrum now because as joseph says the killer has got to be a still around and a member of like this society, like an adult Ooh. working within this society. But the other problem is, is they obviously are into demon rituals, but have to have a really good knowledge of Christianity to be able to pull off and stage these murders. And then they also work out that the reason that the church is making so much money is because this pedophile ring was also selling drugs. And the church was making a good old profit on drugs. And I'm like, wow, you are the dodgiest of priests. I mean, there's one thing like abusing children. There's another thing passing them around. Then there's also drugging them. And then it turns out you're selling those drugs. I'm like, goodness, this is every level of corruption. And obviously our heroes are just like, of a Catholic place, this is like every level of bad. They are like horrified by all what is going on. And... They like we've we've got to solve this obviously for the sake of all the like poor victims that are in this church. So Joseph has an idea and he wants it confirmed, and so they go and talk to James and they're having a chat with James and James is all like, ever since you guys came things have gotten worse. But through this little kind of like conversation, Joseph reveals that James, who the groundsman who's been finding all these people, has a certain condition where he can't see motion. So if someone is standing still. No, no, he can't see standing still. He can only, so he can only see things in motion. Once they stop moving, he's unable to kind of detect like who's there or what exactly is going on. And this is because he got drunk and had an accident and it destroyed part of his retina. And so like he is not able to fully see. So when he thought he saw Mario floating around the place, he didn't see Mario floating around the place because he missed out the person that was strangling Mario. And the little pieces are putting together. So it's like, wait a minute, all this is going on. And there's someone trying to murder Mario as well. And you could just tell how clever Joseph is because he's like, OK, in, in certain stress, like blood rises to the skin. You can see the marks of the stigmata on his neck. So he's deduced that someone tried to like throttle the, the poor, beautiful Mario. And that pisses me off a lot. I just wanted to point these out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> to, to go, don't throttle Mario. Poor, poor boy. And obviously the extreme stress the body goes through when being throttled to death is what's causing his memory blackouts, which is why Mario doesn't remember that someone is trying to murder him. Why they're trying to murder him, we're not entirely sure yet. But all we know is things are going wrong and they're saying that Father Johannes is clearly lying about Mario in the, when the second time they saw it because they're like, look, there is still like stress wounds on him. There is still a pattern that 
Mario is not having actual stigmata. Someone is just trying to strangle the beautiful boy. But then they also work out that another key player who seems to be lurking in the photos and lurking around Mario is one of the very younger and newest priests, I believe, and that's Thomas Simon. And he seems to be up to no good, especially when you find out that he is the one that's shouting, oh, Lord, and having conversations with the beast of 666 that's telling him to like do his bidding. And I'm like, ah, oh, yes, that man is no good. Well, meanwhile, while they're kind of discussing what's been happening, Joseph and Roberto are kind of like going through some of the facts and Joseph sees this mum again with the weird four-eyed baby and we finally get a little bit more information on the weird four-eyed baby so they go to talk to her and they're like um so who are you and what are you, what's what's going on and she's a little bit unhinged herself but yeah she's obviously been through some things and as it turns out holy hell has she been through some things so it turns out the baby that she's been carrying around with four eyes is a straw doll of two children sewn together so she's essentially kind of like recreated something and then she starts telling this beautiful story about how hers is also an immaculate conception and like her father was so happy when she became pregnant and it was all beautiful and her father came down from heaven on the ark and the ark it's called Roosberg and it's like this is this is getting weirder and weirder and they're like oh um so tell us more about your immaculate conception and she was like oh it was amazing I had this weird dream and I went to the ceremony and it was beautiful upside down pentagram was drawn on the floor and all the priests were there to worship me and then the next day I woke up and I was blessed with a baby and you obviously you see it mostly in silhouette and stuff of her obviously clearly like naked and tied down in this demonic ritual of these priest turned up including all our main characters that we've been like well you're all a bit dodgy and we're like well they clearly conducted some horrific demonic ritual on this poor woman abused her and got her pregnant and it snapped her mind a little bit but to add the tragedy to this we find out that she is also the daughter of father brown and it's like, okay, so you're actually the daughter of Mikhail. And her father was so happy that she had a baby. And the baby was called Lord Janus. And it's like, wait a minute, isn't Lord Janus from uh, Roman mythology and was like a god of doors? Uh, something like this. I don't know much about my Roman. I learned this from Percy Jackson. So you have to forgive my knowledge of like Roman mythology. So okay. yeah, this baby has been called I Janus. I can add up more about your knowledge of Janus if you want. Go for it. So Janus was uh, one of the most powerful, uh, even if uh, less known gods in the whole Rome, and he was one of the most feared. He is god of many things. He is god of beginnings, gates, frames, doors, and god of end. He is called Bifron because usually he is represented with two heads watching in opposite direction. He didn't have a temple in Rome because people feared him so much they didn't want to enter a closed place to worship him. So what he had was a building that marked an open enclosure with two gates one at the beginning, one at the end of this beautiful place, beautiful enclosure. When the gates were open, Rome was at war. When the gates were closed, Rome was at peace. Of course, if you know anything about Roman history, you can figure out that the time those gates were actually closed was very, very, very short. But yes, Janus is very terrifying because uh, he's the beginning and the end. He's the first representation of what God is for the Catholic Church. When he is called the Alpha and Omega of everything, is the beginning and the end. But Janus was that long before we had uh, the, the Christian God. So. It's very yes. interesting. Very and, interesting. Uh, and another very interesting thing is that uh, the, mm, the surname Brown that 
can sound English is actually German. And if we add a von or von in front of it, we have von Braun. Von Braun is the name of many important figures in uh, German history and uh, above all in, in Nazi history. Let's not forget that von Braun was also the scientist who, uh, after moving to United States, uh, uh, helped the American to reach the moon. Ah, okay. So little little seeds are being like sown here, and we're starting to get this like picture because obviously we've been seeing a beast with six 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 with two goat heads and the goat body, but looking in different directions, coming to believe that we're looking at the devil. But it's not. They are seeing Janus. Or is Janus now the devil? And it's like, ooh, something cross, like cultural, cross religion is going on. And to add to poor Mary's like absolutely sad tale, like the doctors come out and it turns out that she's gone from a walk from a hospital bed in the infirmary where they're looking after her because she's got schizophrenia and she's telling really weird stories. And they're like, just, don't, just ignore the weird stories. And they're like, oh, we kind of can't, you know. It's like, what's... And they're like, okay, so... She did indeed get pregnant and she gave birth to two children. But one of the children was so heavily deformed, it died, that caused her mind to snap. And therefore, she created this straw effigy to kind of carry around the place to remind her of the child she lost. And you're like, oh, this poor woman, she has been through a lot. And she, they take her back and they're like, this is this is getting weirder this is getting stranger and then roberto says it's so weird that mikhail being like such a revered priest at this school would be happy that his daughter is pregnant when she's supposed to have given herself to god and not get pregnant but also that he calls the child a name of a god from a different religion to the one that he is like practicing worshiping and also like you know teaching so they're like, something is very odd going on here. So our two beautiful boys, Roberto and Joseph, are in their room, their faces very close together. And it's like, if you've ever shared a laptop, yes, yeah, sometimes you get close together. But my goodness, Steph. And I think Roberto doesn't have much interest in personal space because he is, he really gets into some personal space. After like, you know, they're getting into the personal space of over poor Carlos's body when he's like, no, we're coming together. And it's like, they now get even closer. And Joseph is worried that things are going to hell. Literally, things are going to hell in this place. And he's worried Roberto will get caught up in it, get her and put himself in danger. And he's like, he has to be there because much like Job, he is being tested. And only by being tested can he find the strength to help his younger brother out. And he's like, but you, Roberto, I don't want you in danger. You, you should leave. And we get one of our wonderfully little gay moments where Roberto is like, uh, no, do you think I would not be by your side? And then his exact words are like, I thought, I thought we were in this together. We're partners. In fact, I thought we were more than that. It's like, is that all I am to you? And Joseph is like, no, no, that's not all you are to me. And it's like, oh, they're more than partners. They've admitted it. And you get this pan back and Roberto is just literally practically on top of the poor boy in his chair. And he's like, uh, Roberto? Like clearly going her personal space. You're practically on top of me here. And it's all, all very beautiful. And then we get our report from Lauren and we find out the missing pieces to some of this puzzle. And there's a whole host of crazy going on. But we find out. So first, they came here in 1945, escaping from Germany after the Second World War. And they got here on... Well, apparently an ark called Rusberg, which also was the name of one of the few Nazi airships that is missing. And it's like, oh, so the ark was actually a, a Nazi airship that got there. And obviously it's like no one ever found it again because it had, well, Nazis on it that have crashed in this church and rebuilt this church. And we're like, oh, my God. And it also explains like the use of runes, because that's very much used in a lot of like German writings. And especially like when they started using like demonic rituals as a, a way to kind of like advance their cause. We all know that the Nazis dabbled in black magic to see if they could like help win the war. 
And then we find out more about like Heinrich and the fact that it is at the code name for insider trading that is going on within the Vatican. And there's a subsect of the Vatican that is immensely corrupt. Roberto says that they are like the pus of the Vatican. They are corrupt. They are VIPs and they're doing insider trading. They're using the Vatican as a front to launder money, to bribe people, to sell drugs, to just basically be absolutely evil and apparently fund no Nazis. <laughs> so, yes. Not only that, they name a place that is very uh, tight bonded by uh, Nazi history. Uh, so it came out that the laundry money includes uh, some banks in um, Switzerland. We know that uh, in the Swiss banks, uh, there are still the the gold, the Nazi stolen from the Jewish they killed. So we have a connection to Swiss, a connection. They are in Argentina, or at least they are in South, in South America. And we know many of the Nazi who escaped from Europe ended up uh, staying in South America. So we are in South America. We have a connection with uh, Switzerland. Uh, we have uh, uh, the the lost um, her ship that went missing, and we have people coming from um, from from Germany at the end of the war, and we have a copy of the Longinus spare. Yes. Now, that's very interesting because there were. Two uh, societies in uh, Nazi Germany that were uh, very deeply involved with occult and black magic. Those were the Thule Society and the Annenerbe. The Thule Society was very interesting in many ways because uh, they thought that Thule, Thule was a place in uh, Greek, and Roman geography that uh, is now um, recognized in uh, Greenland and Iceland. But uh, for those times uh, when people didn't have the means to, to reach the northern part of Europe because of the weathers and all, all of that, uh, Ultima Thule came to mean a territory in the northern part of the world, beyond the known world. And uh, the legend claims that in this uh, impossible to reach land lived a biologically superior race of people who were called the Aryan race. So Hitler wanted to find proofs that those people really existed because if those people had existed, they were probably like the Norse gods we know about, like Thor and Odin and Loki and the whole pantheon. He could have claimed that modern Germans were descendants from them, so superior by nature to any other race. The Thule society was also implied to work to find the Longino spare, because it said that any army owning the, the legendary spare that transpassed Jesus' ribs when he was still nailed to the cross would win any and every possible war. So, and isn't a little bit strange than a copy, or at least what we think it's a copy of that legendary spare is now in front of a mummified Michael Brown sit on the throne dressed like the Pope? Hmm, interesting. The Annenerbe Society was a little bit more scientific, just a little bit. Uh, they were tasked with proving the Thule's uh, 
origin of the German people right. So not really scientific, but at least a little bit more. Then they uh, totally derailed because they were um, involved in human experimentation in the camps. And he said that um, Dr. Mengele was a part of the NNRB, and we know he was uh, a monster and not a doctor. He was responsible for some of the most brutal human experiments in the camps. So, And we know that Dr. Mengele died in South America, never paying for his crimes. So we've got some bad, bad juju, bad people, bad history. It's not surprising there's a lot of demonic energy and something vile underneath the surface of this church and this school dormitory. So Roberto and Joseph go out at the night to kind of get some more facts and to do a bit of spy work. And they are trying to witness one of these, you know, the devil summoning game. And they're spying on some students who are playing the game. And you can't quite see who any of them are because they've all got their hoods up. But obviously they're using a Ouija board to kind of ask like, oh, what kind of school am I going to go to? You're going to be a great lawyer. And we're trying to get a closer look at the Ouija board. And Roberto is like, this is weird. It's written in runes. And it's like, oh, so this is, this is maybe a German Nazi Ouija board going on. But the kids get spooked and run. And they're like, oh, no. So Roberto and Joseph decide to go chase. And just then, a masked figure with a skull, skull mask jumps out of the bushes and is about to, like, stab Joseph. And... Oh, wonderful, wonderful Roberto. It's like, no, I will put myself in the way. I'm going to wrestle with the knife. And then the episode ends with Joseph shouting, Roberto, as we see splash of blood on the night, like plants and leaves before the credits roll. And you are a monster because you left me with this cliffhanger. I couldn't help it. It was the episode. And I mean... I love it when my favorite characters go through hurt and pain. I'm, I'm, I'm a monster. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Same. Same. You know, I adored the that hand. But hey, I want to know what the hell is going on now. Oh, you'll have to wait till next time. You're a monster. See. See. <laughs> Especially People. since I hold the episodes, so I'm like, I you will release are... the next episode. Hmm. Maybe later today. Maybe tomorrow morning. <laughs> See, people, you are witness. She's a monster. <laughs> I adore her, but she's still a monster. And you know what? And compared to all the crimes that came to light during this episode, I'm like, whew, there was a lot. I mean, there was child abuse, demonic possession, like murder, like ritualistic abuse of a young woman, schizophrenia, mental health issues. Nazis, experiments, cults, and a stabbing. I'm like, whew, that was a heavy 20 minutes. Yes, very heavy. They um, felt much longer. <laughs> yeah, but also juxtaposed with some of the more gayer moments. There was a lot of very close face. There was a lot of like, we must be near each other and call each other's names. And a lot of like, and also Roberto calling Joseph Hiragi. And because obviously in the Japan, you call people by their like second names, but if, or their first names, it's, it always confuses me. But it's a sign of how close they are that he can call him Hiragi, his Japanese name, rather than like his like Western oh. name. So I'm like, oh, there were so many be beautiful little moments for them. And these priests love each other so much. Yeah, but I should have screamed uh, just kiss a couple of times <laughs> yeah. during this episode. You got anything else to add, Miss Gaia? No, not for now. No. Well, so for now, I'm going to say if you obviously like horror and demonic possession, check out our Beneath Your Skin podcast, which you can find through Twitter and Facebook and on YouTube and on Tumblr and everywhere. Obviously, if you like anime, check out my Newbie vs. Weeaboo podcast. Or if you just want to chat to me, Agaya, about life, you can get me on Let Zoe Spoil You. Pretty much gets you on all my social media from Twitter to Instagram. And Miss Gaia heads the Beneath Your Skin over on Twitter. But for now, so, bye -bye. bye. Thank you for listening and see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.